Hello class, this is Miss Augustine. We're still in chapter one, so we're still talking about matter, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the properties of matter. So we've already spent some time defining what I mean by matter, what the difference is between mass and um, weight, and we've talked about compounds and elements. So now let's talk about properties. So properties and changes. So there are two types of properties that we talk about. The first are extensive properties, and they depend on the amount of matter that is present. So if I'm measuring volume or mass, they're going to change depending on how much is present. There are other kinds of properties that don't depend on the amount that's present. And those are the so-called intensive properties. So they don't depend on the amount of matter present. So for instance, with water, it doesn't matter whether I have a cup of water or I have a gallon of water or if I have a million gallons of water. The density of water is constant across all of those amounts. So it doesn't change. The same thing with melting point and boiling point. Doesn't matter whether I have a drop of water or a million drops of water, water will melt at zero and will boil at a hundred. So again, properties that do not depend on the amount. Spoiler alert, definitions like these always end up on tests. So then let's talk about physical properties. Any quality or condition of a substance that you can either observe or measure without changing the identity of the substance is a physical property. So that is your gold standard for determining if I ask you, is this a physical property or a chemical property? Ask yourself, is it still the same substance? If the identity of the substance is the same, it was a physical property. So physical property examples, melting point, boiling point, density, color, solubility, that's the ability to dissolve, odor, and hardness. So again, all of these are physical properties. They can be measured or observed without changing the identity of the substance. So then we talk about a physical change. So a physical change is one that alters the material without changing its identity. And I've already said things like melting, if I have an ice cube and it melts, it goes from being water in its solid state to being water in its liquid state. The identity didn't change. Also, cutting. If I take a piece of paper and cut it in half, it's still paper. If I take a sample of sugar, a sugar cube, and grind it down to a powder, it's still sugar. I haven't changed its identity. And if I take a piece of copper wire and bend it, again, I have not changed its identity. All of these are physical changes. And of course, melting and freezing. I feel confident when I take my ice cube and put it into my cup of coffee that it will still be water and that it will not turn into something else because I know that melting is a physical change. So that leads us to talk about states of matter. I've been kind of banding about ice versus water and water versus steam. Those are different states of matter for the substance water, H2O. So the states of matter that you've learned about previously are solid, liquid, gas, and you might have learned a little bit about plasma. So let's define them. Now I'm going to point out that at this point in the year, we're just going to define them like you defined them when you were in elementary school and at the junior high. But later on this year, we'll have an entire chapter devoted to states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, a little bit about plasma, and we'll talk about the intermolecular forces of attraction <clears throat> and the energy associated with those states. And then later on, we'll spend a whole chapter just talking about gases, and we'll spend another whole chapter just talking about liquids and solutions. But for now, let's just do the old school definitions. So the old school definition of a solid it has a definite shape, definite volume, and does not take the shape of its container. And in general, solids are not compressible. Then we can talk about liquids. That is the state that has a definite volume, but an indefinite shape. Liquids are also the form of matter that flow. 
Um, and that we'll learn later on a little bit more about, but it's because the particles can move independently of one another. In general, liquids take the shape of their container. Container. Most are incompressible. That means they're not compressible. And most expand when they are heated. And then gases are the state that has neither a definite shape nor a definite volume, which means that they expand to fill and take the shape and volume of whatever container they happen to be in. And they are compressible. And the reason gases are compressible is their particles are pretty far apart compared to the liquid or the solid state. And then we have plasmas. And uh, plasma is a high temperature or high energy state of matter um, in which the atoms um, have mostly lost their electrons. Um, plasma is found in fluorescent light bulbs and also, if you've experienced uh, lightning, that is also a plasma. So again, a very high energy state of matter. And it's usually fleeting. It usually only, like in the case of the plasma in a fluorescent bulb, it will only happen as long as there's electricity going to the bulb. And then you'll see that plasma. So this leads us to discussing what a chemical property is. So chemical property is, a chemical property is, sorry, poor English, the ability of a substance to undergo changes that transform it into different substances. So chemical properties are only observed when there is a chemical change taking place. So for a chemical change, we say a change in which one or more substances are converted into different substances. And again, we call that a chemical change or a chemical reaction. And chemical change and chemical reaction are interchangeable for our purposes. So what are the signs of a chemical change? And usually multiple of these are present. So again, spoiler alert, this is the kind of question you might see on a test. This would be your open-ended kind of question. So what are some signs of chemical change? An energy change, it heats up or it cools off. A color change, it used to be blue and now it's brownish. Odor change, it used to have no smell and now it smells awful. Formation of a new substance, so you mixed two liquids together and a solid formed, or you mix two solids together and they turn into a liquid, or you mix a solid and a liquid and it bubbles, a gas is formed. So these things, one, two, three, four things, are what we talk about as signs of a chemical change, and usually multiple happen. So when we're talking about a chemical change, you've probably talked about chemical change last year in bio class when you talked about the equation for, for instance, cellular respiration. You know that there are sides to an equation. So the substances that react in a chemical change, the starting materials, are the reactants, usually written on the left, and the substances that are formed or are produced are the products. And then we're going to talk about the law of conservation of mass. So um, we start this in chapter one, and we will harp on this law of conservation of mass several times this year because it's super important. So let's see what it says. The law of conservation of mass states that in any physical change or chemical reaction, so physical change, water melting, or a chemical reaction, um, iron combines with oxygen to form iron oxide rust. Mass is neither created nor destroyed. Mass is conserved. So what this means is that when you're writing equations, the mass of the reactants always equals the mass of the products. And it means that you can always account for all of the mass during a physical change or a chemical change. Now, that is to say, it's not always easy to do. So when I burn a candle, for instance, it looks like the candle just disappears because it starts out tall and when I'm all done, there's nothing left. However, if I wanted to, I could account for all of that mass. I can account for what happened with the combustion, the flame that I observed, and the carbon dioxide, and um, 
water vapor, for instance, are produced, and there's some ash, so you can always account for all of the mass. So that means if you have an equation written and you know the masses of the two reactants, and you know the mass of one of the products, you can figure out what the other one is using a little simple addition and subtraction. So let's see what that looks like. Practice problem. In a gas grill, propane reacts with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. If 25 grams of propane reacts with 90.72 grams of oxygen to produce 74.86 grams of carbon dioxide, how much water was produced? Can you write a word equation to describe this reaction? So let's give it a shot. Answer. Word equation. Propane plus oxygen yield carbon dioxide plus water. Reactants, products. Let's put in the numbers. We had 25.00, 90.72, 74 74.86, and question mark for water. On the reaction side, 25 grams plus 90.72 grams equals 115.72. Now we can subtract to find the mass of the water. So we're going to take that 115.72, we're going to subtract our 74.86 grams of carbon dioxide, and that's going to yield 40.86 grams of water that was produced. So you can see that the law of conservation of mass allows me to calculate this. So I'm going to leave it there for now. This is Ms. Augustine signing off.